The world is changing at breathtaking speeds, with trends and fads popping up and passing away at breakneck pace. Against that backdrop of nearly constant upheaval, we welcome you to the Sunday Scotch Society. Over delectable, sumptuous scotches and with the occasional good cigar in hand, we have open, honest, and uninhibited conversation about whatever strikes our fancy. Whether it's the critical issue of the day or a deep dive down the rabbit hole, we take it all seriously while having a good time. Join us for a stiff drink and a great conversation. Welcome back to the Sunday Scotch Society. Uh, I am your host, K. Quincy Parker, uh, joined by... Uh, the indomitable Matthew Kelly. Yes. Uh, we, are, <laughs> we, we are taking... I'm not going to comment on that, Matthew. Uh, <laughs> we are taking uh, this uh, journey together uh, on the uh, path to creating uh, for ourselves uh, a a stable of scotches that uh, uh, that we are uh, satisfied with, and that we are able to reach into the cupboard. Or reach up onto the shelf and pull something out at uh, at any given time that would uh, help us to be satisfied with uh, what we are drinking, uh, and something that we would be willing to share uh, with our our community, uh, what or whatever that community might look like. And uh, listen, it's uh, it's an an interesting journey so far, uh, Matthew. I don't know about you, but last week uh, or last episode when we started the list, uh, I I felt myself to be quite uh, quite enthusiastic, oh, quite enthusiastic and quite uh, excited about it uh, because I think the list will. Uh, with the caveats included, uh, be a good record. <laughs> be a good record of what it is we are drinking and uh, and how we thought about it. Uh, last week's uh, dram was the Macallan Sherry Oak eighteen, and it was was a delicious dram. Was it not? Uh, well understated, sir. <laughs> that that Matthew. was uh that was a pleasure. That it's not an everyday thing. Um, oh no, for sure, for sure. But yeah, so good, great way to start off the list. Um, yeah, yeah. I I I do want to make one quick comment here. Uh, I'm a simple man. I am. Oh, God, man. <laughs> I, I I don't think that that uh, although I I will enjoy this broad range, you know I don't think if the list is twenty deep that I'll have more than let's say twenty percent of what's on the list, and I would think that would be like just being way out there. Now for for gentlemen like you and Reed. When he told me that uh, his shelf was eighty deep, I'm like, "That's not, that's not a bar. <laughs> that is a library <laughs> of whiskeys." Yeah, not it's not a scotch; it's a library. You're right, but that's I mean that's part of the that's part of the game, isn't it? I mean, oh, certainly. Uh, I, I yeah. listen. I am a huge proponent of libraries. <laughs> yes, yes, I know you are. I just. I know you are. I'm not going to have one in my home <laughs> of, of that variety, anyway. Uh, so yeah, man, I I'm excited about the list. I, I believe that um, today we're you know because we're in a in, in different spaces, we can't uh, add to the list. But I believe that what I'm drinking today uh, is a strong candidate to get on the list, my brother. Uh, okay. In, initially. I thought that the list would probably end up just being single malt scotches. Um, you, but... you 
Hoity I'm, toity. I'm not snooty tooty. Well, the show is called the, the Scotch Society, Matthew. Certainly. The Sunday Scotch Society is initially listen anyway. There's, there's blends it, and then there's there's blends. Yes. Right. So all scotch is blend. Well, almost. Almost all scotch is blended to some degree. Right? It's just going outside of the still or not and you know, you, taking the problem, whiskeys from other places, etc. Et yeah. et so I'm just saying, like, let's not get too snooty about the thing. Good scotch is good scotch. Good scotch. Even if it's not single scotch, malt. Even if it's not single malt. And We've had uh, blended scotches that I think are worthy of being on the list uh, before. The the famous grouse, Smoky Black, is uh, is coming mm-hmm. to mind. Um, but uh, since we started the list and we agreed that nothing that we had tried before yeah. can retroactively get on the list, um, what I'm drinking today is the uh, the Naked Malt. Uh, blended uh, malt whiskey. And uh, let me tell you about the Naked, right? So the Naked Malt is from the makers of Macallan, the Macallan, uh, the Edrington uh, the house, right? So what they do is they take the Macallan, uh, the Highland Park, and they blend those two together with a little bit of the Glen Roths to create a blended whiskey that is a blend of <laughs> the the three of the best single malts in the in the market. So this unique blend is then aged in sherry casks for about six months. That's actually where the naked in the name comes from, because those casks have never held whiskey before. They, they were, they they were first filled with Oloroso sherry and then the first thing in them after the sherry is the blend for the naked malt. And that's why they call it naked, right? Because the casks are considered naked. But all of that is to say that uh, it is a, it's, it's a hard, hard thing to taste a, a scotch that is better than this naked malt in my uh opinion i i'm i'm stunned by how much this scotch is amazing to me it, you know the it, it has all of the the expected nose notes that you get from uh from a a good scotch you know you got your your toffee your maybe a little bit of fruit um some butteriness um definitely there's a almost a uh uh like uh you can almost smell the barley uh from it um but once you once once you taste it i mean i there's a, a literature word that i love is the word pearl p u r l and i could just feel those uh those aromas purling out into the to to fill up the space that i'm in and now uh on the palate definitely the sherry um i'm feeling pudding i'm feeling baked apples i'm feeling fudge caramel I picked up. I'm picking up on something that you talked about last week you know, with the pecans. You know, maybe uh, pecans, but if they were soaked in sherry, uh, <laughs> you know, oh yeah, for sure, man. Listen, uh, as we have this conversation, I'm gonna 
I'm definitely looking forward to uh, finishing this uh, this drama of the Naked Malt and maybe <laughs> maybe sneaking another one uh, while we talk. Excellent. So uh, today, so, yeah. as yeah, you what said, are you we are in different spaces, and I am taking the opportunity to polish off a bottle of Redemption Rye that I've had for a while. Oh, oh my so, goodness! Yeah, I love that stuff. Um, a little concentrated in in a few ways, as the bottle has been around for a bit. Um, but oh yeah. A little spicy on the nose. Mm, and I just get that nice peppery butterscotch. And that distinct rye taste. Not sure <clears throat> how else to describe that. Um, but I am doing I'm doing an experiment here. Uh in the safety of uh, uh, a space separated from you. S- <laughs> I'm actually pairing this right now with a fruit. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and this is a backyard banana from mother-in-law. And uh, if no one has had a backyard banana recently and still just getting the store bought, man, this thing immediately transported me back to Grammy cutting up a banana into my Rice Krispies when I was like four years old. <clears throat> Just a pure delight in and of itself. But let me tell you, well paired with this with this rye. It makes sense to me. It makes All sense right. to me. Cool. I'll bring a banana for you next time. <laughs> uh, the next time we're drinking... Uh, a rye whiskey, for sure, yes. <laughs> I am not drinking a, a single this, malt scotch this... while I eat a banana, my brother. I'm sorry, that's just not happening. <laughs> See, if it, if if we Bahamians are not going to stand up for tropical fruits, who is? <laughs> who is? I and, hate... this, and this traditionalism, you know, it has its place, Quincy, but change is constant you uh, gotta experiment as as, as is matthew <laughs> being uh well anyway i can i can leave that there because uh that is not appreciable that's not i think the listener filled in the rest yeah exactly I think you're, you're... <laughs> so anyway we we're gonna move on i i look forward to hearing how uh how the ride develops uh while we talk and uh, I'll, I'll of course make, make sure to keep you abreast of uh, what's going on with the um, with the naked malt. But one of the things that I wanted to talk about today um, was As an Italian colleague says to me, "Tell me uh, the action or process of inheriting." an office or a property or uh the 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 process of actually uh creating the circumstance in which an asset passes down from one uh individual to another through deliberate means and not through accident um that's kind of my um uh, amalgamated definition of the word succession and it's something that came uh came to mind during a recent conversation uh about why it is that you see bahamian businesses that are built up through sweat, blood, tears, agony, pain, brilliance, uh, wisdom, smarts, street smarts and cunning. And, you know, people take such 
uh, steps and effort to build this these businesses over mm-hmm. the course of their entire lives, 40, mm-hmm. 50 years pumped into a business. And at the end of the day, when that business is now passed to the succeeding generation to run, mm-hmm. either because the, the generation that built it uh, retires or uh, shuffles off this mortal coil in some way, uh, those businesses die quickly after going through some kind of thinking specifically of a a restaurant that uh, was known for some things. You know, there there's a place in mind where Every Saturday, you knew where you were going to go at your boiled fish. You knew where you were going to go to get your fish or your stew conch. A steamed grits, a steamed tuna, you know, steamed lobster or crawfish. And you know, that this place was an institution. Uh, it, it, it went from one generation to the next in terms of management. All of a sudden, there was uh, new branding. And then within a year, two years after the change, it it was dead because there was no... Well, the assumption is that there was no interest in ensuring that said business continued to thrive. Mm-hmm. And then you take that and you juxtapose it against another set of businesses. Uh, let's say, let's say a construction company, uh, where one generation builds it and the children of that generation are groomed to the, to the degree that they are schooled and trained with the express intention of assuming the leadership of that business. And they successfully step into the role and carry that business forward. And the difference between those two scenarios seems to me to be succession planning. But more fundamentally, it seems to me to be a a way that one of those families, communities, views business and uh, the very different way that the other of those communities takes the view of what a business is and what it can be. Um, Before I go any deeper than that, uh, I I would love to get your response to my opening salvo. Well, I mean, I think you, you lay it out pretty clearly. It's about expectations, intentions, interest um but you sort of dancing around the beating bush with the elephant in the room what do you mean by communities i see what you're doing uh i i will i will take the out on this one and and say it bluntly. Families treat businesses the Bahamian families do. Sorry, uh, you were you were breaking up, so you got to say it again for it to get it clear on the <laughs> recording. Sure, no worries. So the reality uh, uh, that I, I have is that 
white Bahamian families, particularly those associated with the quote unquote elite or, you know, these five family, the, the rumors that people talk about, about uh, these families who are in charge of the economy. Well, there's a reason for that. They, uh, they see business very differently than black Bahamian families do. I mean, if you want to pretty it up, you could say minority versus majority, but really and truly what we're talking about is how the white Bahamian families, uh, treat their businesses and treat their children and the, the place their children have in these businesses versus the black Bahamian families. Frankie Wilson, frankly speaking, Sir Franklin, excuse me, uh, is, is one of the only examples that I can point to of a black Bahamian who built a business and then groomed his children to take that business forward in the next generation and expand on it. But I could give you the, I could give you name after name after name for the white Bahamian families. I won't, but I could. So mm. that's what I, that's what I'm asking you, uh, to respond to. Yeah. I'm, there is not much that I can really say besides some broader discussions on potential differences in culture and i i really mean potential because i'm i'm not i'm not convinced i i don't disbelieve what you're saying but it's too anecdotal for me to to sit here and be like oh okay well that's definitely a a a hard coded truth in the economy um but i am open to the idea that in general these families uh have differences on a on a broad scale when you just look at the 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 data set right <clears throat> mm -hmm. so but but the most interesting questions to me can't be answered without the data set like i want to know of the families that you're talking about in the black and white communities how many like how many of them is this multi generational how far back does that go you know because the political history of the country could play a huge role there mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i got some cousins who i will not name very distant cousins super super distant uh that made their money in rum running. Um, so I, the the point being that the, the history really does play a role, right? And then that money brings political influence, etc. So how far back do those advantages go for each set? How much of the data of the set that we're looking at is made up by each population. And, you know, just being able to interrogate all these different data points to come up with actual trends and then maybe have a discussion about, about what's different. But we can speculate a little bit that um, advantage breeds advantage. No, what you're I, saying, a part no, of what you're no. saying, I'm listening. Listen, listen. Let me finish. <laughs> part of what you're saying is that advantage is being squandered in some of the cases that you're looking at. Yeah. Okay. So advantage breeds advantage. Yes, absolutely. But there is a deliberateness with which uh the 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 advantage is approached that i think is the difference right succession planning uh to 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 use a cliche um succession here's planning. a clarifying question though right 
being you, you, I want to I want to make sure that people know what I mean when I'm talking about succession planning. I'm talking about the process or or strategy for replacement or passing leadership roles mm -hmm. on from one individual uh to that person's chosen successor or whoever is coming next in the leadership role. And the idea that I'm getting at is that with with some families, and let's now remove race from it, but with some families, uh, which I would argue are the minority, uh, the idea is that they deliberately choose who their successor will be. And then they go about preparing that individual or those individuals, if they choose a group, to take on the role of leading whatever the enterprise may be. I think there's a, that the point that I'm getting at is the deliberateness with which the leadership is transferred from one individual or one group of individuals to their chosen successors. Okay. And So that's a statement. Is is the question around why more people, uh, be it in one community or the next, or overall, are not doing it in a deliberate fashion? So the restaurant example, for for instance, right? Are you saying that they did not, they were not deliberate about the way that they went about it, and that therefore fed into the failure of that business. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess that's kind of where I'm getting to. Um, is that I am thinking of uh, yes, yes, I am saying that it is my belief that there was no succession planning. Uh, and that if there was, the individual who was designated as the chosen successor was not given sufficient uh, motivation or opportunity to learn the skills to take over the business. I'm, so if someone I, bleeds I, for... Go on. I, I am I am entirely prepared to be wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that I believe that I am 100% right on this. What I'm saying is that I think that this is a discussion that as a country we need to have mm -hmm. and as a community we need to have. How is it that people bleed and, and sweat and do all the things they need to do to build these businesses and then after one generation it's limited? You know, Well, um, so there's so many sides to this, but let's let's pick two. One is, if you bleed for 40 years, right, and people have seen you do it, sometimes there's an assumption that they understand the bleeding that's going on. When, you know, a lot of times there isn't. You know, it's a popular trope uh, with fathers coming home late from work and expecting their children to know the sacrifices that they are making. But the kids are oblivious. They're just living their lives. Um, another tack that we could take, though, is you love your daughter. Do you want her to bleed as much as you did in getting her into uni and, you know, be it getting set up for life, etc. Obviously, no. Sure, you want to impart skills or whatever, but there's this tension um, apparent to me immediately that, one, people understand what's going on with us and our sacrifices and what hard work it takes to get somewhere. 
But at the same time, when we're talking about our own, we want to protect them. And so we don't want to put them through all the caca that we had to go through to get where we are. It would seem like abuse to your children to do that to, to a lot of people. And I, I mean, depending on how you go about it, it could be. So uh, I don't know what you think about that, sir. So here, here's my job. Um, the idea of having a the idea of having a business um, that I am able to pass on to uh, my my daughter is wonderful and rich and beautiful. And if she has uh, a desire to take on the the business behind me, um, you know, I guess I it's part of my uh, job to ensure that she has the ability to do so. The problem, I, uh, uh, and I don't know if problem is the right word, so let me read for it. The challenge that I'm, I'm talking about is that I don't get the impression from my conversations with people who are a part of success, successful succession planning that there is choice beyond uh, the very rudimentary level of choice. Either you do it my way or you do it the highway. You know, there's that that level of choice that is given in these, and I'm, I'm speaking specifically about family businesses now, right? Mm-hmm. And and I think that that is part of the challenge is that if you build a business and you want to sit on to your kid, you have to start preparing your kid from the time that they are old enough to make choices about what they want to do with their life. And your desire for them may be an entirely different desire than they may have for themselves. And Succession is a challenge in that it requires the successor to desire or accept the will of the person they are succeeding for their own, for their lives and their development. And sometimes that's a problem. But the benefit of it is you start from such an elevated position in the economy and that I don't see how, I mean, I I see advantages and disadvantages to both, but as I say, I don't, I don't have a final position on it, but I think it's something that we have not really talked about as a society as a community, in a way that is deliberate and beneficial to these parents who are spending 40 and 50 years building these businesses with the, with the hope and dream of leaving something to their children. I think there's a missing piece in, in the majority community between the parent having this dream of leaving their child a business and the child picking up the business that the parent wants to leave them and carrying it into the next generation. <clears throat> well, okay, let's let's talk about a little bit about about the parents' desire and what it is that they are leaving and what it is that they think that they're leaving or may think that they're leaving. So, if if you have a desire to leave a business, right? That's a loaded word. What the heck is a business? 
that could be anything from super high end, low employee, uh, high touch. You are the face and uh, of the business and you are super integral. So you're part of the brand, you're part of the sales process, all the relationships belong to you, etc. All the way over to, you know, I own shares. I am operating in the business. Um, I'm the big boss day to day, but I have all of my procedures in place. If I get hit by a bus within the company, things will continue to run smoothly and I could just pass on the shares to my kids. That's a very, very wide gamut. So that's the first thing that they have to be very, very clear on. What is it that they are passing on or want to pass on? And then you could look at the kid's side and talk about interest. Now, obviously, if you give a kid very little choice in the matter. You arrange their life, essentially. Like, this is what you're going to do. Excuse me a second. All right. that That's going to be a much higher chance of success that they actually uh, retain some interest when you're gone. And it means that they're not going to come on when you're gone. They're going to be in the business while you're there. So even if they didn't like it at first, they got too much invested to really just plainly walk away. They may still do it, but they are because they have skin in the game now, they're far more likely to do it in a structured way. So if they don't want to be day-to-day, they'll start to put people in place, yada, yada. They'll still own all the shares. You know, they may exert high level decisions etc but if you're talking about even if a, a someone knows that you're going to leave something to them but they're not in the operations and you have it set that they'll have to take over not just ownership but all the roles that you had in the company that is a plan for a disaster just utterly and completely it's not just about interest. It's about skill transfer and uh, just being a fit or not. And all of the, sh- you basically speed running the 40 years, parts of the 40 years, because of all the relationships internal. Do the employees get you? Um, or do they hate your guts because? They put in 25 years and you just come in here doing all kind of weirdness because you don't understand the business. Uh, The external relationships, you know, maybe (laughs) maybe uh, your parents were great friends with with some people, but they really never liked you as a child (laughs) because the parents are running the business uh, too much to have time to properly um, structure your growth. (laughs) Let's, let's, let's put it like that. You know, all, all of these things. Um, so the the first thing in my mind in succession planning is like, okay, succession to what? What are you trying to leave here? And, it, and if they're going to be taking on a huge role, then that has to be done not with pen and ink, but they have to actually come in and... And practice, be a part of of the operations ongoing before, long before you exit the scene. I don't disagree with what you're saying. Uh, Again, my challenge is that we're not having the discussion. Right? Give me... Give me some meat, man. Paint me a picture. I'm trying to not call names of businesses because it's not about well, the specific the specific business, right? Um, what I'm saying is, okay, you're building a uh, um, a business development uh, empire, right? 
that one 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 would agree that that's what Arling Ventures is. There's a question there, not a not a statement. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, t- I took it to be a statement. Continue. Um, given that, okay, let's not take you because you ain't plan half churn, uh, or at least so you've said. Uh, but let's take one of your partners who may plan to have children. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, uh, they will have a choice to make once you reach a certain level of success. That the business is now something that can, with the appropriate leadership, uh, be sustained going forward, right? It is not going to collapse if you are not the person who's doing it, as long as the person who's doing it is competent. Uh, and you start looking around at the world and saying, okay, well, I have, this person has, uh, they start looking around at the world, sorry, not you, and seeing that, um, they have uh, an opportunity to give this leg up on the economic ladder to their children. Mm-hmm. And they decide, okay, I'm going to leave this business to my kids. Then they have to go through the process of choosing how to do that. Do they, despite whatever their child might want out of life, <laughs> sit their child down and say, I'm leaving you this business and you have uh, to do certain things? Or do they just say, I want you to take this business after I'm done and uh, you know, good luck. I I go back to what I how I framed it. Like, what do you mean this business? Are you leaving them the shares, or do they expect them? To no, operate it? we see this is okay. So about an economic interest in a business. I'm not talking about shares. I'm talking about the actual business itself. I'm I'm talking about a business that will require them to operate the business. Right. So if you try okay. L- l- Arrowlink is a bad example because the structure just wouldn't allow that to happen. Let's just set up a hypothetical where there's a sole owner, right? Whatever they say goes, everything is on. You know, mind. you know exactly what I'm asking. Arrowlink is not Arrowlink is the Arrowlink isn't the point. The point. I understand is... that. I'm for the listener. Let's set up a different scenario. There is a sole owner. Let's just say it's construction for the sake of argument, right? When that when that owner decides, I'm gonna, I want to leave this to my child, right? If they decide that. When the child is five years old or 10 years old or 15 years old really matters in terms of how they should approach this. Because the expectations of the child and the the training of the of those expectations is a huge factor. Or then again, knowing the personalities and what their probable capabilities are. Or preferences will be in the future, also a huge factor. So if you if you come to me and say, you know, is it better for them to just sit them down and tell them I'm leaving you this business, or try to set up a, a more uh, gradual transition or woo them over with incentives, right? It's so dependent. I have a different question for you though, right? Are you mournful of the death of the business or the economic opportunity for the owner's children? Like, what is it that that is concerning you in this? So as I take a sip of the naked that um, 
I don't know if you remember uh, one of the things that I talked about earlier. It's uh, like cream caramel. Uh, it's like a caramel fudge uh, has just really developed uh, into um, like a spicy baked apple type flavor. It is, it's really, it's moving so wonderfully well uh, in, 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 in terms of its development as it sits uh, while we chat. Uh, I'm really, yeah, it's just in, incredible. Uh, so uh, the, what bothers, what, 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 what is sort of, I mean, bother is the wrong word, but what sparked this conversation for me is the concept of generational wealth and the inability of the majority to employ generational wealth in a way that uh, that improves the 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 country and its prospects. Uh, I feel like we have a an incredibly high level of natural intelligence and talent that continues to get uh denuded or or or, or sh- uh, cut cut off or cut down by how easy it is to just go get a job uh at a hotel uh, or to, to go get a job at a government ministry in a in a in a position that does not require that you try to strive to reach your potential as a human being. You could just coast, make a couple of dollars, and live a life. And and I feel like if when we are successful enough to actually build a business, we take our five-year-old child and we tell them, this is what mommy and daddy are doing. And this is how we think you should live your life. This is the thing that we want for you. Then I think that that same five-year-old child will grow up with a different view of life and with a, 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 a different set of motivations that I honestly hope would lead to a better economic outcome. And, and I, I'm using economics really as a uh, sort of a stand-in for uh, the, the larger life accomplishment level. I, I, I know that. I hope people understand what I mean when I say that. Uh, you know, as you said, as, as you said last week, you know, an economy is about transforming energy, right? You take energy inputs. And what do you turn it into? Right. And and that's what I'm talking about here. I'm, I believe that if we got a real grasp on how to truly execute succession planning, those businesses that are the engines of the of communities and the engines of neighborhoods would continue to turn and continue to affect the the quality of life for the neighborhoods where they're located, for the communities where they're located, through and across generations. That's what I'm ultimately, uh, I guess, trying to see and talk about and and imagine if that is a a possible outcome or even a desirable one. I think I get what you're saying now. And there's that individual level, but there's also the societal level, which you, you know, you touched on. But um, one of the aspects being that ownership of the economy in general should be more widely distributed than it currently is. Right. And if you see uh, businesses that took decades to build up going away, that's not a good thing for society on the whole. Um, If that's what you're saying, I completely agree. I don't agree with 
uh, sit your five-year-old down and say the things that you said just now. Uh, but I agree with a similar tack. Um, and so uh, what I suggest is that we pick up this for the next episode. Um, because what I believe is that you could get all those benefits without the you're taking over this business aspect forced upon a child, <laughs> but still retain that that uh, economic advantage and the general prosperity for the community on the whole. So I'm I, I look forward to uh, to tasting what you have in front of you and continue in this conversation. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and perhaps the next time we, uh, the next time we get together in person, um, there, there will be a, a clearer understanding, I guess, of the conversation I want to have. Uh, I just, I wanted to, to bring it up because, uh, it's, it's actually come up like three or four times, uh, over the last week, uh, in separate conversations. And it kind of took me by surprise, uh, that this is something that clearly is on my mind. So, uh, yeah, I, I look forward to, to having some time to think it through and, 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 uh, and thrash it out with you. Uh, the naked malt is, um, it's, it's the stuff, uh, it, my last sip now. Ah, candied apple, a little spice. Um, yeah, I'm I'm feeling it. It's it's the stuff. Yep. So uh, redemption rye. I'm still gonna put a put in a plug for it. You know, that's a that's a go to crack open when you have a friend over. Uh, last drop there was just very developed into a cinnamon mint. Ooh. Lovely stuff. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I know. Uh, this, this, this. Uh, forgive me for sounding like a commercial, but I know that I, uh, you could get both of those things at uh, at uh, Jimmy's Wines and Spirits. In in case you were wondering where to get them, so uh, there it is, Matthew. Thank you for uh, a great conversation as usual, my brother. Um, and I look forward to uh, to seeing where we go next with this because I think this is. Um, a, 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 a sort of a, a larger conversation than we were able to have today, uh, but uh, but it's something that I I, I think we should definitely uh, continue to pursue uh, here on the show. And I look forward to it, man. Yeah. All right, yeah. that's the rovia, my brother. Ciao, everybody.